Uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here today, uh, sharing these sessions with all of you. Um, I wasn't sure who will be the participants. <coughs> so the, the slides uh, might be a bit technical, but I'll try to be as as uh, as as layman as possible. <laughs> all right. Um, we're gonna start a uh, uh, talk. Uh, I'm gonna start talk about uh, common cases of palpitations. What is palpitations? And let me just share my slide with you guys. All right. So I choose the topic today as our heartbeat matters. Or should you say every heartbeat matters? Um, just a, a simple, um, basic, general knowledge. Um, maybe some of your mothers out there might know this. It would be interesting that when I presented this to a group of, of mothers before, and there's few fathers there, he actually seems to know more than the mother. So, The first question I asked was, uh, when did your heart start beating? Um, you already had an answer there, but, you know, we during the process of development, uh, the embryo start from a single cell, split into two, four, uh, eight, sixteen, and then carry on. Um, as we grew older, uh, we need to have uh, uh, blood to as as the nutrients to continue the development, and it is actually started beating at the age of three weeks. So I asked them, when, when did it stop beating? <laughs> of course, it's the last day of our life. And interesting fact on the last section there, uh, it takes only sixteen seconds from a single cell on our fingers go through the blood circulations, pass the heart, and come back to the to the to the fingers or toes again. <clears throat> And then people talk about my special interest is electrophysiologist. So people ask, what is an electrophysiologist? <laughs> the simple answer that I explained before was uh, electrophysiologists deal with the electrical activity of the heart. It's like an electrician and most of the interventional cardiologists which dealing with uh, putting a stand and an angiogram is, is a plumber to the house. <laughs> Um, but interesting in fact that, that every living thing or every living uh, structures, especially in our bodies, need a bit of electricity to serve their purpose. If you look at the brain, the synapses, it's actually just multiple connections of small electrical circuits which then trigger all of these memories and the way we think and all of that. And you imagine if you want to move your hand, that the brain actually send electrical signal to your hand and the muscle just respond to that. So same goes with our heart. Um, uh, luckily, this actually was done automatically. So in order for the heart to beat, you need to have an electrical circuit that trigger uh, uh, muscle, muscular contractions. So if, you, if your heart rate is about 60 beats per minute, then every single second there is cells in your, in your heart which is on this yellow dot here, that fire electrical impulses every second, the wavefront travel across to the lower chamber of your heart, which then represents the, which translate into different contractions of your heart muscle, initially by the atrial, the upper chamber, followed by the lower chamber. And the only way for the blood to move forward to the lungs and back to the organ, get the oxygen and all of that, is through this pump. So the electrics can be translated as life. And that's what is the basis for, you know, you all watch the movie Frankenstein. The scientists thought that if you were to channel electrical impulse through a body, you might revive a person who is dead. Which in a way, partly true, but of course you cannot do that in real life, is it? <laughs> so people ask about palpitations. What is palpitations? In general, people talk about palpitation as a rapid heartbeat. 
or the feeling of one's heartbeat going too fast. Like when you get excited, when you see someone you like, <laughs> then your heart go very, very fast, out of the normal conditions. Our heartbeats actually can go fast in response to our activity. Say, for example, if you're running around, your heart rate can go up to 160, 180 beats per minute. But we don't feel it because it's, it corresponds to our level of activity. When we stop, then the heart rate starts to slow down. When we go to sleep, it can go as low as 40 to 50 beats per minute. So the abnormal awareness of one heartbeat is, is called palpitations. Majority of that is because of the fast heartbeat, but some people also experience things like skipping beats or, or a few irregular rhythm or, or abnormal sensations across their, their chest or their heart. <laughs> Right. If you look at this example, I asked the audience before, who actually having palpitation right now? <laughs> um, so the answer is actually both of them. So the, the mouse is actually scared and then the heart rate goes very fast. And they can also get excited. They may have their, their prey that they can, <laughs> they can play or catch afterwards. So both of them have a bit of what we call palpitations around this time. But what is the common contributory factors for palpitations in terms of what we call external factors? You know, if you have people have a bit of anxiety, if you get scared or something just, you know, jolted you when you're sitting around in your living room at night, uh, your heart, you can feel your heart rate suddenly go fast or faster than normal. And certain stimulants like caffeine, smoking, chocolate, alcohol, all of those, uh, I was going to say food, but, but things that can actually trigger or stimulate <clears throat> our body. You know, caffeine has got, is a stimulant, smoking in terms of uh, nicotine, chocolate itself is a form of caffeine, and alcohol, of course, is a direct stimulant to the brain. And what it what they do is is actually increase the the hyper or the stress hormone, which is the adrenaline, which in turn increase our heart rate and also increase our alertness and awareness. And that's why people say that, say for example, they were doing an assignment that stay up at night. They need a bit of coffee to keep them awake. The reason being is because they need that stimulus. Certain medication can actually increase our heart rate as well. So beta agonists, any of you who are asthmatic, you know, you take your inhaler, those are beta agonists, which work against the beta blocker. Uh, beta blockers slow the heart rate down, so beta agonists then make your heart rate go faster. This actually help to open up your airways so that you breathe easier. Theophylline is, uh, is the oral form of the medication for people who have asthma. Of course, we talk about illicit drugs, talking about morphine, um, nicotine, all of those are actually stimulants. People feel high because of that. It's actually over, over, overwhelmed with the brain stimulants. Now, when you ask someone with palpitations, I put it in yellow, those are the things that, that if they have palpitations, uh, which made worse by exercise, or they start to feel fainting or syncope, or people with prior heart attack. Those are the nasty or, or bad recipe for possible serious complication, <clears throat> together with the history of cardiomyopathy and also family history. So if you have any of that and you have palpitations, then ideally you should refer, or, or if you yourself had it, then go and see a doctor. Um, <clears throat> probably gonna skip that maybe a bit too much for you all, but the main thing I want to talk about this slide here on the red box here, which really touched uh, at the beginning. If you have palpitations with exercise, or you have palpitation and you feel fainty, or any of those conditions for high grade AV block or ventricular tachycardia, then they should go and seek medical help immediately. Whenever you go and see doctors. <clears throat> For any for for heart reasons specifically, or even if you go for your health screening, a lot of us will have this what we call twelve leads ECG done. 
Now, if you remember, if any of you had it done and you remember how was it done, then you remember that they put a lot of leads onto the body. One on the right hand, one on the and and one on the right leg, maybe one on the right or on the left leg, and so so across your chest. So all in all, you have ten leads, which then the computer or the ECG machine will uh, translate or or generate a computer data representing what we call twelve leads. So this is what we call it twelve leads ECG. Now if you go back to that, this is what it looked like. Now you may ask me, what is the purpose of this? How do you look? What do you see in this? So this is actually a basic principle of physics. Um, this actually represents the summations of the electrical circuit or electrical activity across our heart. So lead one is this one here from right arm to left arm is looking across the heart. So if you can see here, this is the electrical activity. The smaller one called P wave represents the activity of the atrial, and the bigger one called QRS, the activity of the lower chamber. And the last wave is the T wave, represent the recovery wave. Perhaps it will be make it easier than to explain this. This is how we look at the ECG, the physics principle, as I said. So in lead one, you look at the heart from right to left arm. If the electrical impulses travel from right to left, then if you are sitting from the right side, the electrical impulses is going to go away from you. I guess probably the easier imagination would have been imagine yourself at the train station, maybe at the girl center. <laughs> you arrive at the main station there. If you're, if the train is, say for example, you are at the platform and the train is going away from you, you can see the train getting smaller, smaller, smaller. So same with the, if you are in the position A. If you are in the position B, for example, you are maybe in, in Putrajaya, trains from Kel Central to <laughs> Kel A. So initially you see the trains coming towards you, if you're not boarding the train, then once it passes you, it's going to go away. So you see positive and negative, i.e. getting bigger and smaller. If you are in the KLIA, <laughs> as the train is coming towards you, you just start to see bigger, 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 bigger. So the same principle with the ECG. Here, you can see the complexes here. All of those uh, directions or the amplitude of the wave, or what we call it QRS, represent an activity of the heart from where you're looking at. So here is schematic representation of that, lead one, lead two, lead three, three, two, three, and AVF, and all of those things. So imagine, say for example, this electrical current from here, and you are, suppose this is actually an example of lead two, if you remember this, this is lead two here, looking at the heart from here, then, if the wavefront is coming towards you, then you're going to see all positive. If the wavefront is going slightly at an angle, still positive, but will be smaller amplitude to that one. If it is going across, then you can see what we call isoelectric, i.e. same amplitude of going and going away. If it is, if the direction is going away from you, like the last one, then it's going to be the opposite of number one. So this is the ECG. And this is actually the electrical impulses, the true electrical impulses when we bring patient to the electrophysiology lab. Interesting, isn't it? You can see the beautiful, what we call 3D manifestation of the ECG. So this is the origin of the electrical impulses here from the sinus node. The electrical wave travel across the upper chamber first, the atrial and ventricle, and it hits the lower chamber going across the specialized conduction system the electrical impulses then transmitted across the lower chambers instantaneously or simultaneously so you can have that p the electrical wave here followed by this so very fast krs and the last one is just the t wave which is the recovery and using that information you can actually tell whether your electrical activity is normal or something else is going on with your heart Right, so I'm going to skip that. We're going to go straight to the possible KISS uh, demonstrations. 
So this is a 30 year old lady who presented to emergency department with palpitations and almost near syncope. You can see here, compared to the one before, this is an absolutely abnormal ECG. You can see here it's very bizarre, very broad, very fast and irregular. And the principle of treating patients in emergency is that once, if they come with this and they become unstable, then you have to correct this as fast as possible. And the best way to do that, if of course you may try medication, but a lot of them will take some time, is just to give them what we call cardioversion. Cardioversion means, uh, a lot of people think cardioversion as jump start. <laughs> you know, when they have a broken car, people jump start. <laughs> it actually doesn't work like that. When you give the electrical cardioversions, it's actually stop all the electrical activity and, and resetting the heart, hoping for the normal our sinus node to wake up and start to take over the, the normal function again. So what the electrical cardioversion do is, is put a stop to all of this. You're gonna see a slight pause and then resume by this. So in this scenario, this patient had, after the cardioversions, you start to see this ECG. For those of you who are doctors out there or even health uh, professionals, you might aware that this is what we call an abnormal ECG, also called as WPW. They may also present it with this. You see here, this ECG showed a very rapid heart rate. So if you see the boxes, see the boxes here, the heart rate is calculated by 300 divided by all of these big boxes. If, if the interval is between two big boxes, then 300 divided by two would be 150. So you see here, it's about one and a half. So this patient heart rate is about 180 or 175. In other words, this is if your heart rate is this 170 at rest, this is what we call tachycardia because it's so fast, it's very, very fast. And for those of you who are aware of what we call, or what I said just now, WPW, it simply means that in the normal conditions, the electrical activity can only go down as the first uh, moving slide that I showed before to the ventricle through the atrial ventricular node. When you have WPW, what it means is that you have an accessory circuit that allow the electrical impulses to go down to the ventricle through a different channel instead of that. What it does is when you have this, then this is what we call early excitations of the ventricle or pre-excitations. So the ECG that you've seen before is patient who had atrial fibrillation, which they have very fast atrial activity, which then get conducted down to the ventricle so fast that it can also create a faster uh, lower chamber of your heart. So this is a schematic representation of what could have happened if you to have uh, an accessory or extra circuit. Say for example, the one that I showed you before, that patient developed tachycardia because there is an electrical impulse that come down the normal circuit, <clears throat> makes its way back up through the accessory wiring system and connecting back to that. So this is what we call re-entrant loop. It could happen more or less anywhere around the heart involving either the normal structures or any electrical circuit which has a connectivity or, or connections. So it could happen here, this is what we call atrial re-entrance. It could happen here, this is an AV node. It could happen here, this is what we call atrial ventricular tachycardia. Sorry. So best option for these patients, um, I guess some of you are underwriters. You know, you keep asking doctors a lot of questions about what is the EP, why do you need to do EP studies? Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the angiogram and angioplasty, but when I fill up the questionnaire for a patient with palpitation and a lot of questions come back saying, well, what is the EP study? Why do you need to do that? The patient need to be admitted for this? The answer is yes, because this is invasive procedure. You have to put a wire into the patient's heart on a different location of the heart, um, this example here, then we can see a different signal and we can actually stimulate the heart to to see where is the circuit, first of all, or what is the circuit, what is the diagnosis, and then 
treat the patient according to the 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 need or what is what is needed. An example that, that I showed you before the ECG, this patient had a connection here on the patient's heart, and this is the circuit. So what we need to do is just ablate. This is what we call ablations. So ablation means you apply a, a form of electrical energy uh, through the wire that then touch the heart or the heart muscle. And from this tip of the wire, the electrical circuit go through that. It create a kind of electrical burn to the, to the heart muscles. And if you aim to the specific abnormal area, then it will just then get rid of it completely. So once, once you cut off this circuit from going around, then the patient more or less cured from that condition. So if you look at this example here, this patient initially presented with this. After we've done the ablation, this is what happened. So you see here, this is what the normal ECG should, should look like. And this patient will never have the same problem ever again in their life. So this is more or less a curative procedure. There are not that many uh, therapy in medicines which could actually cure your condition. For example, if you have if you have hypertension, so if you have high cholesterol, you're just gonna have to take the medication for the rest of your life. Whereas if you undergo this sort of procedure, the patient will have the chance of ability to have it cured. They just want off therapy and they say can go on carry on living as normal. Right, so case number two, more or less around the same note. So this is a normal ECG into space with the abnormal ECG uh, or abnormal complexes. So this is a normal one. You can see here P, Q, R, S, and then followed by this no P, suddenly you have a very broad complex ECG. If you were to apply the principle of physics that, that I kind of demonstrated 10 minutes ago, that if it is negative, especially on this lead, so you know that it's coming from that lead. And lead V1 or V2, in this case, lead C1, C2, is actually sitting on top of our chest. So from there, you can work out, this is similar ECG, patient presented with this, you see here, V1, V2 negative. So it suggests that this is a heart as view as a surgeon cut it open. So the anterior most of the heart is what we call the outflow tract. So this typical example of ECG suggests that the normal focus that is firing is coming from this area and spreading across the heart. So what is the best thing? Of course, you can try medication around there. We may give you partial or temporary relief, but more permanent solution to that is now we're going to go into a bit more detail of what we can do in the electrophysiology lab. The uh, combination with the 3D mapping technology, you can actually map this electrical circuit of this patient. And here you can see the 3D uh, anatomy of the patient's heart. And from the color coding of this rainbow-like you know, uh, uh, color scheme, the red area represent what we call ground zero or where the initial uh, location of the normal focus and the purple or the blue represent the area which is further than that. It's like imagine you drop a stone into the pond where the stone drop is here and this is the wavefront that tra travel across the heart. So all of those informations and by way of 3D mapping, you can actually, with a point, pinpoint accuracy, locate the focus of the abnormal activity. So once we know where it is, then you can just aim the wire, the ablation catheter, to that red area and start the ablations. You can see here, even though it's a small print, we start at about 1.18.10 by 1.18.10. 14 or 1 18 16 or about six seconds later it's all gone so same with the other one to start with a lot of abnormal focus here that's it it's all gone <laughs> um and just go to go to show another example here uh, again this patient had a lot of this abnormal focus so we can actually map it out 
using this 3D system, same principle of color coding, and we call it latest activation timing or LAT. Then you can locate where is the abnormal focus. So here in this map, this is combination of the right atrial chamber, and this is the left atrial chamber. So this patient had a normal focus on the middle of it. So without this 3D map, you cannot accurately locate that. And maybe if you were to do ablations, you may not be able to get rid of the abnormal circuit. This is another example. The patient presented to the ED department uh, with a very rapid heart rate. You can see here, very broad and, and regular, but very fast. And this is what happened when we slow it down. For those of you who work in the medical uh, or healthcare system, you might be aware that this is what we call atrial flutter. And again, we brought this patient to the lab. You can see here, you remember just now the ECG, this is just part of the right atrial, we call it. You can see here, the circuit is going around like that very fast. So that is one of that circuit represented by this sharp, we call it sharp or, or, or sore tooth pattern. So as the wave going towards wherever you are, it becomes positive, it goes away negative, and then as it keeps going around the loop, and it becomes positive again. So this is what it is. So if you do ECG, you can see that. And some of it actually travel down to the ventricle. Most of it will get blocked. So normally the atrial flutter rate is about 300, but most people will present, when they have the ECG presented to the ED department, their heart rate is normally about 150 because of the AV node has the ability to block some of the conduction system. And this one, actually, interestingly enough, they just keep going on and on and on. One of the best treatments for that is, of course, cardioversion, but you can actually permanently cut it off all. So this is what we've done in the lab. So the same patient had a, this loop that goes around here. We just create what we call a line of block. So this is the atrial, the tachycardia, which is still going on. The minute you complete that line of block, boom, it's terminated. The patient go back to normal. They go home, happier person. <laughs> this is one of the other common examples that we normally face uh, in our day, daily practice. A uh, patient presented with a condition called rapid irregular heartbeat or atrial fibrillation. And <clears throat> this is just to show what we can do to them. Uh, apart from medical treatment, you can actually go inside the heart, map all of this elliptical circuit of atrial fibrillation. If you look at that, this is what happened in patient with atrial fibrillation. You can see a lot of small, irregular, rapid firing electrical activity over the, the atrial. So what we need to do is then modify them or uh, isolate all of this electrical circuit. Typically, uh, there is a procedure called isolations of the pulmonary vein and also isolations of the, or decompartmentalize decom the atrial. And by doing so, you actually regularize the electrical circuit. Here, you can see the terminations of here. It's very fast, irregular electrical circuits become back or, or reverted back to normal. And patient go home with this. So, I guess maybe it's a bit too much of the cases, but um, one of the main messages I want to convey is that, just going back to the previous slide that I've shown, um, perhaps if any of you or if any of your friends or colleagues complain of a patient, be it irregular heartbeat, missing heartbeat, fast heartbeat, or rapid heartbeat, best is to go and seek medical uh, advice or get yourself checked out because you never know. It could be something trivial or, or, or benign or it could be something which lead to a life-threatening condition. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, all right. Let's go. I'll just end this. Stop the share. Okay. q and I'm going to be my own host. <laughs> uh, first question. What is the normal heartbeats per minute when going for an outdoor walk? Is it, I usually go around 
uh, 120 to 140 bits per minute. Right, so has any of you been to what we call a executive screening program when they put you at a treadmill and people talk about target heart rate? So this, this target heart rate is simply a number that was done on a normal patient, on normal people, to look at what is maybe the maximum that you can achieve. So they come up with the numbers of 220 and whatever your age, just minus that. So say if you are 40 year old, then your maximum target heart rate, if you were to do exercise or stress, would have been 220 minus 40 will be 180. Is there a danger that you reach 180 bits per minute? No. Most of us, when your heart rate reaches 130, 150, that you reach a phenomenon called uh, hitting the wall. You know, in, in terms of physiology of exercise, hitting the wall means when you reach that, then you cannot carry on with that fast heart rate for more than certain numbers of time, maybe five or ten minutes. Then you're gonna slow down or stop. Say, for example, if your heart beats, uh, sorry, if you if you're running, when your heart rate reach one sixty, within five ten minutes, you just wanna walk or slow down. So if you were to go for just a normal outdoor walk, normally you would expect, depends on your level of fitness. If you're not fit, then your heart rate can go faster, fast. Meaning, it can, sorry, it can go fast, faster. <laughs> Meaning from resting maybe 80, it may go up to 100, 120 at a normal pace uh, within about five minutes. If you walk faster or brisk walking, it may go to 130 or 140. Um, I guess it depends, number one, that. Number two, how old you are. Um, normally, if it's just a simple walk in the park, you don't expect your heart rate to go up to 140. That's slightly a bit too fast, unless you are really, really unfit or had a, a other underlying medical conditions. So, the heart rate actually represents the, the amount of work that the heart needs to do to produce a certain uh, work body output to sustain, to maintain whatever activity you are. Say, for example, people with a, with a heart failure or, or, or heart problems, their cardiac output, when it, uh, sorry, their stroke volume, whenever the heart pump, it can only be about 40 minutes. Uh, every time the heart contract versus maybe 120 minutes for normal people. So for them, when they do exercise, they need to have more cardiac output. Their heart rate tend to go faster. They, they tend to go fast, faster to try and cope with the, the need for cardiac output. So I guess if it is 140, just a normal walk, maybe you should go for, for a check. This is categorically can be considered as slightly abnormal if it's just a normal walk. What is syncope? Answer. Oh, sorry. Uh, syncope means faint. Oh, this is this is a, a I think it's Greek word, <laughs> Greek origin. A lot of these term in medicine use the Latin or Greek uh, for the doctors to memorize that, and normal people don't understand it. Interesting. Isn't it? <laughs> So syncope simply means uh, fainting or loss of consciousness. Uh, the main organ that control our alertness is brain. So when patient had syncope means they suddenly just, the brain just ceased to function. They just fainted. It's either because of commonly, uh, they have a low blood pressure because the heart stopped or, or failed to produce the, the blood pressure or uh, due to an, an abnormal brain activity. In example, when patient has seizures, so you may have syncope as well, or fainting. Uh, prior MI. MI actually means myocardial infarction, so heart attack. Okay. All right. Next question is from Kairil Anwar Rusli. In the event that we experience irregular heartbeat during sleep, how do we detect the ECG graph as we do not experience it during the daytime? A very good question. Yes, if you go and see doctors, 
uh, or, or any healthcare providers, when they do the ECG, the window of looking at your heart is only within about 30 seconds to one minute window. So if you feel it at night time, by the time you go and see doctors, your heart rate could be normal or your heartbeat could be normal. So they might actually miss or not able to tell you what is going on. So a lot of things that we can do to try and, and capture or catch this. One of the things that, that, that people or doctors might uh, advise you to have or, or fix on you is a heart monitor called a halter. Uh, used to be a lot of wires that come with the halters. Nowadays, we have a very small patch-like halter that you can actually bring home. It's also waterproof and you wear it overnight. So if you experience it at night time, then there's a higher chance that we may be able to capture it. And a lot of this holder can actually last, uh, or now we have an extended uh, monitoring period, and some of the patients can actually monitor your heart for up to two weeks. And there are some which is a bit more advanced, we call it implantable monitoring device, who, which can monitor your heart rhythm for up to three years. This is particularly useful for patients who have had uh, an episodes maybe once in every three or four months. So if you were to put, you know, 24 hours or even two weeks, you're gonna miss that because they don't have it every day or, or every once in two weeks. Uh, okay, so next question is from Nita Azlin. Salam, alaikum salam. My grandma had atrial fibrillation and undergo ablation last year, but sometimes still have complication. Is that normal? So a lot of these patients with palpitations, uh, they actually have what we call trigger in the form of abnormal ectopic beats. So it is possible that, that ablation for atrial fibrillations is actually not the same as ablation for SBT. In other words, when you have atrial fibrillations, there's a lot of abnormal area on your heart, particularly on the left, uh, left atrial, which is firing and causing these atrial fibrillations. So sometimes when we ablate, for example, the cases that I've shown, we actually create or regularize the electrical circuit as much as we can, <clears throat> hoping that that would prevent this abnormal focus from firing or from the atrial fibrillation to uh, recur again. So this is not a curative procedure, uh, but compared to medication, it is, it is 80% to 85% success. So there are some patients who may actually had AF again, or if we were to get rid of the atrial fibrillations, now they may have what we call trigger, or the abnormal focus is firing. So the best is to go and, and bring your grandma for another checkup. How do we differentiate between palpitation and anxiety attack? Interesting. So anxiety simply means some form the way how you handle stress. So, so some people, they, they become overwhelmed that that by itself, it trigger or initiate a very fast heartbeat. So anxiety and palpitation could be superimposed or, or could come together. And people think that they may have anxiety, which turn out to be palpitations. And normally anxiety come with the, with the what we call psychological uh, manifestation as well. And they start to feel panic and then, and, then, and then they start to you know behave and normally start to breathe. One of the features of anxiety attack is, is uh, heavy breathing. So when you breathe too fast, then they start to blow off more carbon dioxide and they start to develop these tingling sensations of your lips and, and your fingers. People with palpitations, they don't have that, that elements of anxiety per se. But palpitation, heavy palpitation itself can trigger anxiety attack. So that's why I say it's, it's, it's a mixture between the two. So I guess maybe to differentiate between the two, if you just have purely palpitations, then you may not have the other symptoms of anxiety in terms of numbers or, 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 or this panicky feeling. Um, uh, we answered that already. How do you do determine that we are having palpitations. So this is going back to the, the first few slides that I've shown. So palpitation means an abnormal awareness of your heartbeat. Say for example, I were to run 100 meter dash. I don't feel it 
I don't feel your heart rate can go up 240 150 beats per minute. I don't feel it when I was running, but when I stop, everything stop, you could still feel your heart at that time going so fast before it start to slow down. So that moment of feeling that your heart beats fast when you are not running is not normal. I mean, you are recovering from the exercise, but if you're resting suddenly, your heart rate goes to 150, that is considered palpitation, but in the form of fast heart rate. There's also people feel palpitation uh, when they feel some extra kick to their chest. It just goes suddenly, just go to, 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 and then normal again. Or it just go to, 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 to. Those are possible uh, uh, abnormal rhythm. So that by itself is, is called palpitations. So if you feel or, or aware of any of those, just go and check. Does hormone changes cause palpitation? Yes. Normally when you have this, what we call maybe possible, menopause and all of that, the body starts to respond to the different in, 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 in our hormonal systems. And one of them being is, is the stress hormone or the adrenaline. So our heart rate, are or is regulated by this different hormone inside the body. It's part of the nervous system or, or the uh, uh, the autonomic system which regulate your heartbeats. In other words, if you go for exercise, the way the heart rate goes fast is because the body releases adrenaline. When you go to sleep, there is part of your brain called parasympathetic or vagus nerve which slow down your heart rate. So in, in our body, there's always going to be two different mechanisms, protagonists and antagonists. Same way with both the fingers, that is a different muscle. To straighten it back, it's a different muscle. So same with your heart. When you go to sleep, it slow down. When you have excess hormone or this uh, stress hormone, your heart rate can go fast. You may develop palpitation. Uh, do you have, a, oh, maybe this one can be answered by our team. Yes, I go to show oh, the whole tour looks like. Maybe our next presentation I will put up on our uh, slides as well. Sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia, instead of you having a different focus that is firing, your own sinus node, for some reason, is firing faster. So tachycardia simply means heart rate is faster than 100. So sinus tachycardia can also manifest or be a manifestation of you are doing exercise. That's why we call it sinus tachycardia because heart rate goes fast. I mean, you look at the ECG, you can see the P followed by KRS. Or simply just doing exercise. You know, when you put on the treadmill, your sinus node is going to fire faster, then your heart rate is going to go faster. But there are also patients who have what we call inappropriate sinus tachycardia, in which they actually sitting down quietly, but the heart rate is 110, 120 beats per minute. When you do ECG, you can see P, which firing faster. Uh, that's what people call it sinus tachycardia. So the best way is to check to see whether is this really is sinus tachycardia, or there is a condition which is quite similar to that called atrial tachycardia, and the P width may look similar to your sinus. Okay, so cause of excessive palpitations. I think some of it has been mentioned in the slide presentation before. Uh, a lot of it could either be something abnormal with the electrical system, but there are external factors, for example, people with a thyroid, hyperactive thyroid, or drinking too much caffeine, or smoking <laughs> too much. That can cause excessive palpitations. How can it be prevented without ECG? ECG is just a means to diagnose what sort of palpitation you have or do you actually have palpitations. Maybe you mean by prevent the excessive palpitations. If it's due to external factors, for example, medication or drugs, then you just have to avoid them and go and check your doctors to see whether you have any other underlying condition which can cause palpitation. Uh, does this can affect vertigo? So vertigo simply means <laughs> your brain is sensing an abnormal position. Uh, so vertigo is something to do with the, in our ears, we have 
an organ called semicircular canal, which has a fluid inside it and a sensor uh, that detect your uh, locations or your movement. Say for example, if you are in the dark room, but the room is on the incline, you can tell whether the room is saying it or on the incline. The easiest example of this is if you are on the boat in the middle of the ocean, you know when the boat is rocking around. And that's why people sometimes, people have vertigo, is because of these senses, suddenly either you get infections or maybe people build up crystals inside the, in the, the, the circular canal inside your ears, which then trigger an abnormal senses. So you feel that the room is spinning around, like motion sickness, and you're gonna be sick. So that's slightly different to palpitation. Uh, <clears throat> What is the remedy for case expiration, rapid habit, or normal patients in case hospital or clinic is not accessible? Right, so say for example, there is a condition called SVT, or supraventricular tachycardia, which sometimes people feel their heart rate suddenly go very fast. The easier, immediate remedy for that is sometimes you can try what we call Valsalva maneuver. <clears throat> You just take a, either a pen or a small syringe. You know, the hole is small on this pen. You just take a deep breath in and blow, cover your lip around it and blow it. So by doing so, <clears throat> you actually increase, suddenly increase the pressure inside your, your chest wall. And inside the chest, they have the sensor, the vagal sensor, which would trigger what we call vagal maneuver. So the vagus effect then would terminate or stop this tachycardia or the other options you can try is you know when people had hiccups normally what I would do is take a deep breath in and hold it for maybe 30 seconds it's almost similar effect or the other options is you can just uh, drink a very cold uh, ice which can also slow your heart down in fact traditionally this is a treatment for babies with with palpitation they just take the baby and, and plunge them into a, a basin full of ice and the, the tachycardia stop. Or if you're at home, just go under the cold shower, it might help that. But best is afterwards, go and sit down. Uh, having palpitation, we seem to have a lot of questions. I might skip some of the questions at which could have been repeated. So, all right, let's carry on. <laughs> we still got time. Having palpitation upon consuming coffee, is it something that we need to worry about? If it is troubling you, coffee by, if you drink coffee as a normal person, you don't normally develop palpitation per se. But caffeine, as I said before, may trigger uh, either an abnormal uh, ectopic heartbeat or uh, if you start feeling something not quite right, suddenly your heart will go very fast after a cup of coffee, it is also not normal. So you better go and check. Is it normal to have low heart rate, 40 to 45 beats per minute? The answer is yes. Um, as mentioned before, all of those, uh, the, the, what do we call it? Protagonists and antagonists. So when patients who are doing a lot of exercise, for example, athletes or professional footballers, uh, they are very good too or the parasympathetic tone is very high, that when they go to rest, then their heart rate can actually just beating at about 40, 45 beats per minute. As long as you do not have any symptoms with that, meaning you don't feel dizzy or tired with that, this is completely normal. If you look at the uh, definitions of bradycardia, any heart rate less than 50 is considered slow or low. So yes, 45, 40, 45 beats per minute is still within the normal range, uh, more so if you're asleep. I guess I'll just take two more questions and then we'll have to wrap up. I'm so sorry, we have a lot of questions. I'll be happy to answer that. <laughs> Let me just go around. And I'll answer two more questions and then we can 
we'll have to stop this. Maybe we have to have another session. <laughs> I actually enjoy this. <laughs> uh, I really answered that. Okay. Maybe I'll just answer this one. What is the treatment for leaky valve which cause palpitations, right? So the heart is a, is a, is a unified organ which has electrical circuit, the valves, uh, the chambers, and all of that. So any disturbance to all of those structures can lead to disturbance to other functions. In other words, people with a leaky valve Say, for example, we do have, if you go by, by terminology, we have mitral valve, tricuspid valve, and all of that. The common cause that, that may cause palpitation in most people is a problem with the mitral valve. Either they have a narrow valve called stenosis or leaky, in other words, regurgitation, the blood is going back through the valve to the other, way, the other directions. What happened in the mitral valve cases is that it will create an overload of pressure to the other chamber, which is the atrial, in which then lead to abnormal activity of the atrium, particularly we're talking about possibility of atrial fibrillations, or earlier on it could be atrial tachycardia, which lead to palpitation. All right, so last question. Okay, from Abdul Muhaim. What is the usual medication to prevent palpitation? So a lot of this medication was this uh, was designed by the scientists. It actually works in terms of controlling the electrical circuit. A lot of electrical circuit, or all of this electrical circuit, if you were to break it down, put it under a microscope, involve a different channel of different what we call uh, ions either sodium, potassium, calcium, uh, and, and combination of, of, of them. So a lot of this medication works by blocking, either modifying this channel functions. That's why some medication called beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, uh, and then in terms of flaconite, it works by blocking the sodium channels. So all of this medication works by modifying the electrical circuit, the electrical firing, or the electrical activity of the conduction system by way of either slowing it down or increase the durations of the impulses, which in a way also slow it down and stop from whichever uh, abnormal focus or abnormal circuit which is faster uh, from taking over the, the, ele the electrical function of the heart. I probably have to stop here. Yeah, it's a lot of. I wish I could answer all of that. So sorry. <laughs> I'll pass it back to our chairperson, uh, Chani. Thank you very much for the session. I hope I can have this again in the future. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us today for this um, AIA talk with Dr. Zhu. So I have also dropped a link um, just in case if any one of you were wondering or would like to make an appointment with Dr. Zhu, you can click at the link uh, on the right side of the chat box. And um, just to also um, let everyone know that Dr. Zhu's clinic usually runs on Monday, Tuesday and Thursday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And on Saturdays, it's 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. So um, Dr. Zhu is also actually um, uh, expertise in uh, electrophysiology and cardiology. And he was actually based in IGN for nine years. And now he has recently just joined us um, in CVS KL. So we definitely hope to service all of you here in CVS KL. And we're looking forward for the next session, of course, with uh, Dr. Zhu. Okay, thank you very much. Bye, everyone.